Thank you. So good morning, everyone. I'd now like to call to order the meeting, this meeting of Human Resources, Governance and Stakeholder Relations Committee of Waterfront Toronto. I've been advised that a quorum is present and it's appropriate to proceed. So firstly, welcome all of uh, everyone who's joining our meeting today. We have a number of important items and we appreciate your interest and participation. And I'd also like to remind you that the open session of today's meeting, sorry, my phone is ringing here, um, is being recorded and will be posted for, for the public to view. And uh, also our board chair, Steve Diamond, who will lead one of the matters before us today, will be joining us about, about 9.15. Um, so we'll start off with our land acknowledgement and as is our custom. So Waterfront Toronto acknowledges that the land upon which we're undertaking our revitalization efforts is part of the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. In addition, Waterfront Toronto acknowledges that Toronto has historically been a gathering place for many Indigenous people, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Ashinabic, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat people, and is home to many of the First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples today. Um, so I now um, would like to start with the first item uh, of the approval, which is item number two, the motion to approve the meeting agenda. May I please have a motion to approve the agenda for the meeting. Is there a mover? Thank you, Paul. And a seconder? So seconded. Thank you, Raul. All in favor, contrary, so that's so moved. So let's move to the declaration of conflict of interest. I now ask if there's any conflicts of interest to be declared. None, none declared, we can move on to the business of the meeting. Thank you. Um, so next up is the consent agenda. And the first item of business is the approval of the minutes of the open session of the March 3rd, uh, 2002 meeting. May I please have a motion to approve the March 3rd 2002 meeting open session minutes. Is there a Go mover? Move thank you, deep. Paul. Oh, thank you, Raul. Thank you, Paul. All in favor? Okay, so, so moved. And uh, now I think we'll move to uh, the environmental, social and governance ESG update from Lisa Taylor. Thank you, Wendy, and good morning, everyone. Uh, this environmental social governance update is a new report and it's been added to all committee agendas based on feedback from the farm committee and consistent with ESG being a core responsibility in all three Waterfront Toronto Board committee mandates. As noted at the top of the report there, ESG is embedded in the corporation's mandate and it, so it's been something that we have always done for the last 20 plus years. But now with an increased focus on ESG matters by organizations globally, we wanted to more deliberately um, report on the various ESG initiatives that we have underway and that we're involved in. And so what we've done is attempted to do this in this two page summary. This, it, this list that you see is certainly not exhaustive. It's also not cumulative. While it outlines current activities and some of the next steps, our ultimate goal would be to eventually also have a KPI dashboard of key ESG indicators attached. Uh, this, is, this is a first draft. Um, we welcome any feedback from the committee, either now or subsequent to the meeting, to make it more meaningful. Uh, to date, as I mentioned, it's been shared with the Farm Committee and IREC, and it will also be part of the June 23rd board package in the consent agenda there. So I'm going to take the report as read, but I just wanted to provide those, those comments for context. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Raul. Sure, just a quick comment. First of all, I think this is great. Uh, it's really helpful. It's concise, well presented. Uh, the alignment with the UN SDGs is really leading edge, and I think it's really smart on our part to do it this way in particular. I think I'd like to table for a subsequent conversation, you know, at a maybe the next year's retreat for that matter, um, about looking at the, uh, the UN SDGs and which ones in particular we can impact and why. Because clearly there's been some choices made and I don't question those in any event uh, at this point, but I think it's, it's really good uh, to align it with those. It's great to be reporting against them. And at some point, you know, being a board that wants to be outcomes focused, it'll be good for us to look at the US UN NDGs at SDGs and actually determine which of those we think we can impact and why. But just table that for another day, but great start. Great, thank you. 
Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, so now we can move to item number five on the agenda, the Human Resources Report from Rose. Great. Thank you, Wendy. Good morning, everyone. I'll take the HR report as read and just provide some highlights and some of the efforts that we've made since the last quarter. Uh, Charmaine, do you mind please bringing up the dashboard from page 14? Thank you. So we've updated the HR KPIs for this last quarter, and I'll start with the top left quadrant, employee work-life balance. To assess this, as you all know, we measure average vacation days taken per employee. In Q4, we saw a slight increase in time taken compared to the same time last year and slightly less than in Q3. This was likely impacted by starting to, staff starting to feel more comfortable with traveling, as some of the travel bans and provincial restrictions were lifted, as well as the March break season. Overall, for the fiscal year, the average vacation time taken is higher than in the last two years. We have a very strong work culture here at Waterfront Toronto. We continuously remind staff to take vacation and encourage work-life balance. We hope to see these numbers increase over the next few quarters as the summer months are upon us. Let's next go to the top right quadrant for employee well-being, commitment, and motivation. To assess this, we measure average sick days taken by employees. In Q4, we saw a slight decrease in time taken by employees. Generally, sick days have been trending downward since the beginning of the pandemic. A contributing factor to this we found was the corporation's pivot to remote work to support health and well-being. This provides staff flexibility when you're not feeling 100% for some downtime at home in between meetings. Overall, for the fiscal year, the average sick days taken is slightly higher than last year Again, this could be influenced by the hybrid of returning to the office and remote work arrangement, the reopening of schools in the fall, <clears throat> excuse me, the Omicron COVID-19 variant last year, as well as the anxiety and other mental health challenges relating to returning to the workplace. We hope that the longer summer days and the warm weather contribute to employees getting outside more fresh air and out outdoor activities, thus lessening sick days as well. If we move to the bottom left quadrant, employee satisfaction, to assess this, we measure voluntary employee turnover. While the great resignation continues to trend, in Q4, we saw a big decrease in voluntary exits compared to last quarter. In fact, we had no voluntary exits in the last quarter. Overall, for the fiscal year, the average voluntary turnover rate is higher than we would like it to be. Besides a great resignation trend, another possible factor could be the effect of deferring the recruitment and replacement of several positions, resulting in additional workloads for some, thus making it harder to retain good staff. And finally, let's move over to the bottom right quadrant for employee development. To assess this, we measure learning and development spending and usage. In Q4, we saw a significant increase in both average dollars spent by the employee and the number of employees using the program. Overall, we noticed that the average spent by employees was the highest in the, fisc highest in the fiscal years compared to the last fiscal years. Some contributing factors to this over the year, we feel, is the revision of our learning and development program last year, as well again as employees feeling more comfortable for in-person in -person learning sessions and conferences due to the provincial restrictions being lifted and us slowly coming out of the pandemic. Overall, with the increase in vacation time and decrease, decrease in sick time, we hope that employees take the time to recharge, work smarter, not harder, reduce burnout, and continue to increase productivity. We also hope that the corporations continue to support an investment in employee learning and development opportunities will result in an increase in employee engagement, productivity, and retention. Now, if I can give a quick update on recruitment. As of March 31st, we remain at 99 positions. For the period April 1st to March 31st, we hired and onboarded 60 new employees and we facilitated the exit for 22 employees. 14 were voluntary, three were terminations, four were end of contract and one was a conversion to consultant. Moving along to COVID-19 updates. While we, when we last met in March, we advised that all employees would be returning to the workplace one day per week starting March 21st. That did occur. We also transitioned to two days a week beginning mid-April. To support contact tracing and well-being of employees, we also implemented the Robin check-in system. 
It has an active health screening system for all employees entering the workplace and allows employees to reserve their workstation. The system also supports us to identify and notify any employee who may have been exposed to another employee testing positive in the workplace. Just a few more points on general HR matters. To further enhance and support our workplace planning strategy framework, this quarter the HR team continued with the implementation of the HR module within our current ERP system. We had a soft launch in early April and we are currently validating data and expect a full rollout to training to staff before the end of the next quarter. The HR team also completed a, a transition to a new updated payroll system platform and we went live with the March 31st payroll. We expect that both these new HR module and playable payroll platform to create efficiencies both within the HR department and for all staff. Also in this last quarter, the HR department welcomed two new staff members. We added an HR coordinator and hired an HR manager to cover Kaylee's maternity leave. Adding to our team was beneficial in moving a lot of our projects along in this last quarter. We are furthering our Indigenous cultural training by continuing to enroll staff in the next training module from bystander to ally. All new incoming staff are also required to complete both the first and second module of this training. And lastly, before I get into DED, e and i because we've previously offered webinars supporting mental health throughout the year, in the last quarter, we decided to organize and provide a webinar on physical health. That focused on creating and maintaining health, healthy habits to promote healthy eating, physical activity, and better sleep. I'll just touch on a couple of DEI comments. You'll recall at our last meeting in March, MNP attended and presented a final report and implementation plan for our DEI strategy. The strategy was developed through in-depth interviews with board members, senior leaders, and VF staff focus groups. The findings showed that Waterfront Toronto's culture is healthy and will support further DEI work, which we're very excited about. Work has started on the strategic recommendations, including the implementation plan. The first action item was to la launch a confidential and anonymous workforce demographic survey that was launched in April. The survey would allow employees to self-identify and provide a baseline demographic snapshot of our current workforce. The analysis report will be shared with the CEO and senior management team to review the high-level data before rolling out a communications plan to all staff. An interesting fact to share, for internal surveys, that are rolled out in the North America workplaces, a participation rate for surveys between 30 and 40%. I am extremely happy and proud of our team because for our first survey, we received a 90% participation rate. This is proof of high, employment, high employee engagement at Waterfront Toronto and highly engaged employees are less likely to job hunt, let's hope. We will update you further on our progress with DEI and hope to move to the next chapter. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Rose. Any questions for Rose? Raul? I just want to uh, pick up a theme uh, that we'd spoken about some time ago, and, and that is around uh, COVID, hybrid work, and the sort. And from time to time, George has made some comments about the, the challenges in recruiting um, apart from COVID. But my, I guess my question to Rose is, as you think about uh, recruiting, okay. More and more, at least I'm seeing in our world, more and more people are having a higher expectation of remote work. Yeah. And so you've gone to kind of one day, then two days. Um, we're doing the same thing. And I'm finding there are folks that are coming in and saying if they don't have a fully five day option to work at home, that they're going to opt out because other employers are providing that option. You yeah. know, can, you, can you help me understand a little bit your thinking about how you're going to navigate that? Um, yes, before I hand it over to George, I will say that Raul, I have, we have, the team have seen those challenges because we do get candidates that say, oh, you're not fully remote, thanks, I'm going to bow. You're absolutely right, but I'll move this over to George. Yeah, no, uh, and Raul, I think, uh, you know, as Rose identified, we, we actually re-entered the workplace earlier than many. Um, we started back in September uh, with a day a week, and then we moved in October to two days a week. Uh, then in December after Christmas, when things got quite worse, we shut down until April. Um, and we've been gradually responsive and we've actually used our health and safety committee, uh, which includes employees to guide us 
Uh, so we, you know, started again in April and then uh, we're back to two days a week. There are, there is a preference uh, for some uh, to have more remote work for sure. Um, we are currently still at two days a week in the office, so not, uh, not a huge expectation of coming back yet. We are going to have to uh, look at this and we're looking at it not just from the perspective of recruitment, but we're in the midst of an accommodation plan. Um, and that's an important part as well. So uh, Avis and Young, we had the discussion with them as to what employers are doing. Um, they're shrinking their footprint for anybody who's not coming. They are using hoteling space. Uh, the dilemma is that people, we've done surveys, people want to keep their office but not be here either. Uh, <laughs> and that's not going to be on, so I'm going to be upfront about that. Um, so we're going to continue to work. We're doing a survey right now, and I'll get into some of this detail later. Um, on the accommodations, we've narrowed it down to a couple sites and uh, trying to survey people about you know, uh, the number of days and what the options will be, because there will, there will be more collaborative space, a smaller footprint in all likelihood. Um, but we are going to have to be responsive to the market. But I think it's really important because of our mandate that people are here to, you know, part of our mandate is to revitalize the waterfront. Well, if people aren't coming into work, we're not helping the retail uh, on the waterfront survive. So we're trying to balance all that out. And also, if I may add, George, the synergies of working together as a team is quite different when you're physically in the office than when you're working remotely. So, you know, moving to three days a week is is not bad. And I can say that from some of the exits, some of the staff members that exited because, Raul, to your point, they went to an employer that is fully remote, for example, I've now heard back from them that they've actually left those off of those new roles because they didn't see the gelling of a team. Um, it wasn't the same. You know, we're not a call center, a, so a sales center where you can, or, or you know, a hoteling. Um, it's different when you're here. It's different from working virtually to working physically. The other thing, Raul, is we get into the diversity, inclusion, and equity issues. Uh, you know, we're trying to engage uh, with different communities. Um, that is something you have to do physically. You have to build that relationship. So. We've done, I think, a really good job at balancing and staff, I think, have been very responsive of. In fact, I have new staff who have been anxiously waiting for everybody to come back to the office because they haven't met, uh, you know, they've been here over a year and they haven't met the entire organization and we're not that large. So we're trying to balance that out. But uh, to your point, Raul, we'll have to be you know, uh, balancing the responsiveness of being able to retain and recruit with the intent of providing leadership in the community towards our mandate. Right. So all good points. I've got no issues with that. I guess rubber hits the road when suddenly uh, recruiting yeah. efforts are seriously hampered because there's not enough remote opportunity or people are just opting out, which, by the way, we'll, we'll, kind of, we'll find out. But that gives you an opportunity potentially just being creative for a second to double down on your earlier point, George, that, you know, to really do the job, um, you need the connection with the community and you need people in the office to create that sense of it and to become a potentially an employer for people who precisely want to do that, but they're not looking for a remote opportunity. So, you know, there might be a chance to actually play that up because I can say even in our workforce, you know, I've got half the folks that, you know, never want to come back to the office and the other half that are just, you know, chomping up a bit to get in. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think the, other, the only other thing I would say is um, we have a, we built a really strong culture here, as Rose said. Mm -hmm. um, people have stayed, even though they've had opportunities to make more money elsewhere. Um, we have to be competitive, but I think one of the big assets we have is the culture we have. So the Barrett uh, cultural survey pointed out we have a very good work culture here. Um, as Rose pointed out, we've done a number of surveys and Lisa uh, would point out we've probably done three or four mm -hmm. and our participation rate is always in the 80s and 90s, uh, which is unheard of. And I, again, I think it's because we have a great culture where people want and we give people the opportunity to have input into the decisions that we're making. There's certainly no survey fatigue here because people want that voice. They understand that we may not be able to give them everything on their wish list, but they appreciate the fact that we are listening. 
And, and one small thing, Bill, that you might like to something else George said, as we've got all this new staff, and as George mentioned, people don't know each other. One thing I forgot to mention in my report, it's minor, but it's still important. We've revitalized, if I may use that word, our social committee. And we've, you know, done some terms of references. We're going to kickstart with a pride celebration this month. And before COVID, we used to do so many more social events, obviously. Um, we used to celebrate International Year, International World Day. We'd have different foods and potlucks that a lot of our colleagues could attest to. We had some great synergies, and we're going to try to bring that back. So. Great. Any more questions for Rose? OK, thank you very much, Rose. That was very Thanks, good, everyone. very comprehensive. Um, so we'll move on to item number six on the agenda, the staff performance review. And as directors are aware, the fiscal year end of the corporation is March 31, and it's at this meeting and then our board meeting um, in a few weeks that we receive a report from management on staff performance for the year. And this is part of the mandate of this committee. And so the materials are contained in the board book, but I wanted to take this opportunity to thank George and the entire Waterfront Toronto team for all their exceptional work this year. And as jo George noted in his report, this was another extremely busy year for Waterfront Toronto and the pressure of the pandemic and everything else put on the activities of the organization. And although much of the public attention has been on the high, our high profile projects, Portland's and Keyside, the reality is that so much more has been achieved. And I'll note that more, a more detailed information um, will be available um, through George and Steve in our closed session. And George, I'd now ask you to please present your report. And Steve, right. our chair yeah. is with us. So welcome to our board chair, Steve Diamond. Thank you, Wendy. Good to see everybody. Thank you, Wendy. So um, just to give a, a little bit of background in particular to our new board directors, um, over the last few years, we've taken a lot of steps uh, in terms of raising the bar, quite frankly, in terms of what we expect for performance. So we have five categories where we look at, you know, uh, exceeding uh, expectations, achieving expectations plus, uh, achieving all expectations, which is still a good rating, achieving some expectations and then expectations not achieved. So we used to have a, a quite a bit of the uh, distribution on the first two categories. We redistributed that over the last few years, uh, balancing that out. Uh, we have had a number of departures, some voluntary, but some not. And we wanted to make sure we have the right skill set for what we need going forward. So we had to work in, uh, with staff and um, sometimes they had very good skills, but their skills were better suited for a different time. Um, so you, you will see over the last few years that our salary envelope, because we also froze salaries of our, uh, uh, of our executives, uh, we did leave a little bit of base increase, but that was, again, only 0.79%, uh, so not even the 1% that uh, the Ontario government uh, had put forward as one of their targets. And I should point out that target uh, of 1% is kind of on the base and allows for uh, much larger increases in governments by having step functions in addition to that. We don't have that, uh, and we'll talk a bit about that in the private session. Um, so we are, have increased this year uh, the ratings on the higher end for some of the staff, and I will point out why. Uh, if you look at the list, we have really delivered this year. Uh, I'm extremely proud of the team that has delivered not just the big projects that uh, Wendy uh, pointed out, that we, we have a lot of artwork that we put out uh, and got international recognition is also on our architectural design on the stormwater plant. We've done a lot of work for the city with regards to the roads uh, on Lakeshore, and we took down the Gardner Expressway on the east end. Um, we continue to deliver a lot of things that don't get media attention, uh, but we also have gotten a lot more media attention on our overall strategy and plan. So our five-year plan, which rarely got media attention in the past, got a lot of media attention this time. Um, staff, I'm not going to go through the whole list. Uh, if people have questions, I, I would just say it was an exceptional year. Um, why I've rated higher on the top two ends this year 
is we have saved uh, $2 million the previous year, $2.5 million last year, because I have not filled vacancies. The reason I did not fill a lot of those vacancies was I was expecting that through the government strategic review, we would understand what our new mandate would be going forward. And I wanted to leave uh, flexibility to be able to hire the right skill sets going forward. That has clearly taken much longer uh, to resolve than uh, expected, but staff have picked up all that extra work uh, on their on their shoulders. Uh, so, you know, the, quite frankly, our base staff now are doing you know one and a half times what their job is. That's not sustainable either. And I'll be hiring on contract uh, to give us flexibility for the next year. But uh, you will see that I'm only taking a very small portion of the two and a half million dollars in savings. So the organization uh, saved four and a half million dollars in salaries just in the last few years. So uh, I will go into more detail as to what we're recommending. But we also had uh, Heather, who will join us very shortly in the closed session, who has done a survey uh, around certain categories of uh, gaps that we have that uh, she'll identify as she looked at the, the market and how far we've fallen behind in certain categories. Um, and I will provide recommendations with regards to what we should do going forward for the board to consider. Um, and then Steve obviously will speak to my own performance uh, after I get a chance to talk to uh, the executive performance. So the only other thing I would say is uh, I'm blessed that I do have some exceptional staff and some of the people that we just hired in uh, to Raul, your point, we've still attracted some really exceptional people in even during these tough times. So really pleased that you know, our reputation uh, continues to be a draw to people. And uh, but I have to also say we're kind of hitting the wall with regards to uh, a growing gap between ourselves and the rest of the market, which I'll speak to very shortly. Um, but I'll take questions, Wendy, if anybody has and I just remind people I'll get into more detail in our closed session. Any questions from the committee for George? No, thank you very much. Um, so now we'll move to item number four on the agenda, the board retreat. And as uh, directors know that we have spent the last three to four months um, planning uh, the sessions, the three sessions, and uh, a big thank you to everybody who's contributed. It's been extremely helpful. And management have distributed materials um, for our planned retreat next week. So a lot of work has gone into planning the day and it should be a very um, good educational and uh, and stimulating session. So it'll be an, an, an important opportunity to get together to learn and, and share our thoughts and, and to you know, really identify the sort of strategic priorities for the organization going forward. Um, does anybody have any questions at this stage about the retreat? We can also talk about it in closed session. I'm just okay, wondering if Paul could, could also get me a cup of coffee. <laughs> okay uh, so then we'll move to um, the motion to go into closed session please so may I please have a motion to go into closed session to discuss items 9 10 and 11 on today's agenda and I thank you Raul thank you Paul um, so, so moved and I just want to remind everyone that any resolution considered in the closed session needs to be passed when the meeting returns to the open session. So the, um, we're now on item number 14. We're in the public session um, and we've returned to open session and have resumed the recording of the session. May I please have a motion to approve the March 3rd, 2022 committee meeting closed session minutes? Is there a mover? Thank you, Arul. Thank you, Paul. Um, all right, so I'm going to have a motion to terminate the meeting and we are two minutes over. So I now declare the meeting terminated. Thank you very much and thank you for the good discussion today.